Today is the last seminar of the 50th anniversary of the Instagram Seminar Series. I'm pleased to have you all of you here. Today we have Jayati Ghosh, Professor of Economics from the University of Massachusetts, Armstead, USA, and co-author of the Earth for All uh, book. Uh, Jayati, you know, if you are there at the very now, I can, people can see you. There are a few people here in the room as well. Hello, everyone, and uh, I'm happy to be with you even virtually. I know it's very cold out there, so maybe I'm not so happy, uh, or rather, I'm, I, I don't mind not being with you physically for the cold. <laughs> <otherwise>. <laughs> yeah, of course, I agree, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, thank you, Jayati. We will make a more formal interaction of Jayati for his experience, really. Uh, so, Jayati, I'll say you. Hi, in, in like five minutes, I'll be back to you, okay? Thank you very much. So uh, as usual, I'm, I'm very happy to acknowledge and thank everybody supporting us. So starting from the Synergy, Center for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governance, represented here by Sergei Kolesnikov, Deputy Director of the Institute. So Fox and Energy Policy, Making Change of the Real World, um, really, not, not just researchers, but people who want to make a change in the real world for, for real, right? So, not just academics. Uh, then we would like to acknowledge the uh, the Conservation Research Institutes uh, that host really this building, as well as support us with uh, with these uh, with this series. Of course, I thank the Club of Rome that support us in a lot of different ways, advertising supporting us, putting the video of the previous seminars online, uh, give us the Zoom accounts, you know, they, they, they did a lot of different things. And also all the speakers are coming from the Club of Rome as well. So definitely thank Club of Rome for this. All the voluntary basis, everybody get paid or anything. Uh, thank the Bad Institute for Public Policy. And that also, you know, focus on, on, the, on society and making change. So again, they support us with this. And then the Global Sustainability Institute at Daniel Rask University. It's a place we worked on until six months ago, and uh, led by Ali Jones, director of the institute, and uh, uh, yeah, also very interdisciplinary research uh, on every kind of sustainability you can think of. So as usual, I'm actually as is the last one. I'm going to first say you know summarize what happened in the past for the first time. So we had Jorgen Randers. We started the seminar series. It was about, um, you know, uh, his his journey. So he's one of those pioneer, pioneer, pioneering limits to growth 50 years ago. And he gave us the story about that. And so the video is now online. That was followed by Gaia Arrington, who recently she got a bit more a public figure because she did analysis on the World Tree, comparing that with historical data, and she presented that. Then we went into more qualitative things like Julia Kim, she presented about the global uh, happiness index. So she, she went into the challenge of what we measure, why we measure, how we measure to make, uh, you know, and she presented basically the, the case of Bhutan on that. So it was very interesting presentation. Then we went to Hugo Bardi, it was quite interesting with this sort of mousetrap story to demonstrate how nuclear reaction works and then demonstrate anything about natural resource collapse and things like that. So it was more on the physics and modeling side. Then we had Manfela Ranfele speaking more about the consciousness linked to making change in the real world. So a very human-centric type of talk, and she's the co-president of the Club of Rome. <laughs> then I gave my presentation. Uh, it was last time, and it was speaking about my modeling work on finance and natural resource limits. And then today we have Jamiati. So uh, as usual, I present these slides just because it gives like a hunger to what these people were famous for. These are the team, the team Yogi Runners used to be younger as well, uh, 50 years ago. Um, Donella Mendoz, Dennis Mendoz were the trio uh, publishing all the books, 1970, 1972, 1992, 2003. Uh, and they were famous because of these big, crash they've done. So they, they demonstrated the world could collapse because of exponential growth by 2100. That was the big point. And after that, there was a lot of criticism happening. And today, you know, for all, somehow answer to some of this criticism, we can say, 
But because it is the last seminar, I also want to say that a number of these criticisms were captured in this, uh, in this seminar series. So there was a problem in use of technology developments, data parameterization. I think we covered them a little bit with my presentation and a bit with uh, Gaia's, for example, complex feedback loops and nonlinear relationship. Again, maybe if you think about what Manfela said was about looking at the reality of people, not just looking at models. And then the distributional issues that was challenged again by uh, by Gaia, lack of green energy was my presentation, lack of proper presentation of mineral sector and fisheries, Ugo Bardis, then things like there was no financial sector, they didn't model financial sector, it was put in my presentation last week, uh, the digital sector also somehow was captured slightly in my presentation, uh, impact of nuclear and banning toxic chemicals and climate change again was a bit captured in different presentations. These were lots of different criticism of the War 3 model, it was the model built up 50 years ago. And interestingly, today I want to speak about the following book. I don't know if people know about that. Have you ever seen it? Mm. Main kind and the turning point, the second report of the Cabo Brown, was 1974, so two years after the Emissive Brown. It's kind of interesting, it's simply because that was written by a person called Mihailo Mezarovic and Edward Pestel, were also part of the Cabo Prom at the time, professors. And basically, I mean, this criticism we are glad here after you know 50 years, they're not new. <laughs> so they realized that exactly the moment they put the model up there and got so much criticism. So the second report that came around two years after was like, they were wrong. They were like, there was something that we don't agree with. So that's what they said in that book, right? They, they put up on the top what Forrester Meadows uh, approaches. So one, two, three is basically the, the limits of growth thesis. And then they say, that's our thesis. So we don't want to model the world. It's not going to collapse all together. It's going to collapse in regions. So we divide it in regions. Uh, and they say literally, uh, viewing the world as an entire homogeneous system is leading to erroneous conclusions. Okay, they said that, the Cabo Brown said that two years after. Okay, this report doesn't exist <laughs> in practice to human beings. Nobody sees that, nobody saw it all over the places, but they were very clear at the time. This was the problem. So, what they did was a regionalized model, of course. Right, they they had the original model. They started putting a number of systems, you know, uh, groups, stratum, ecosystems, and technology. And so they basically answered those questions, and they connect the economy. They make a network of interconnected things. That's basically a much more complex system. Uh, and the modern equality at the very start. This the chapter. The, this one is chapter five, right? I left the book at home, pity. But basically, uh, this book is even out of print. <laughs> if you want it, you get a used copy. But this one was called the Too Little Too Late Scenario, exactly as we have today in Earth for All. And they were looking at inequality. The main thing they didn't do was to go beyond 2025. So they stopped there. Of course, until 2025, they grow, keep, keep going, right? and uh, they don't collapse anything. Of course, that's why it wasn't seen anywhere else because it was like just one of the many studies. Uh, and then they did, do a bit of analysis on the oil price, oil resources, so basically a bit more, you know, less strong type of scenarios, no world collapse, no people dying. Inequality rising, yes, demonstrating that is a problem. And uh, but yeah, that's basically what, what was their, what their thing, their, their take on things, right? And today, that for all, is kind of repeating that sort of effort in a completely different context. 50 years later, the world has gone towards a certain kind of direction, and they try to, again, make that change. But the most important thing to realize from this presentation now is simply that it wasn't true. It, it wasn't new. It wasn't the, the thing that we discovered 50 years after. 
they just accept the, the very moment in which the publisher needs to grow because of the criticism. We are still at the same point. Sounds like we are there. Okay. Uh, and then Jayati will speak about inequality. And that's why actually I actually want to present a little bit about this because the first question I can ask at Jayati is what changed? Why today we can make a difference and we couldn't do 48 years ago. So uh, Jayati introducing her, she's currently a professor in economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the US. She's definitely internationally recognized for her work in equality and debt crisis. So you can hear her on BBC or you know, CNN in the US. Uh, she's a member of the UN Advisory Board on Economic and Social Affairs, member of the WHO Council of the Economics and Health for All, member of the UN Secretary General High Level Advisor Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism, so really uh, in, impressive career. In the past, she spent a lot of time, 35 years, teaching economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. She had affiliation in the University of Cambridge as well, uh, UCL. She authored and uh, edited at least 20 books and more than 200 articles. Three of the main books she wrote are the following Informal Women Workers in the Global South, When Governments Fail, that was linked to, I think, the pandemic aftermath, and then this uh, these latest book, The Making of a Catastrophe. Um, again, links a lot about the debt problem and inequality. Um, so really, uh, based on that, uh, Jayati was a leading author, so she's the third author here listed in the Earth for a book, so she's one of the main contributors to this book, and uh, at this point, really Jayati, I'll uh, simply let the floor to you, and thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Roberto, and thank you really for that excellent introduction to the issue and to the uh, background for the Earth for All book, which I'm sure everyone in your audience now knows uh, is what was 50 years ago. And the Club of Rome basically thought that they should look at this issue 50 years later in terms of what has changed, what hasn't changed, what, which, where are we heading? What does all this mean in terms of what humanity can do to avoid very adverse outcomes. And so there was a uh, commission that the Club of Rome set up. And uh, I see that Gaia is here, who is also a member. And uh, it's um, Roberto has mentioned that uh, he's actually brought in stuff that I didn't know either, the 1974 report. <laughs> I'm ashamed <laughs> to say I had not come across it myself. So I now we'll try and get hold of a copy and see, because clearly we are repeating things that were said 48 years ago, and that itself is a bit of a tragedy. But perhaps I, without further ado, I should just share my screen. In, in our book, in Earth for All, we talk about how there are five turnarounds that are necessary and uh, to, to deal with the climate challenge, to address all of the major uh, problems we are having in terms of sustainability, harmony with nature, the problems of, you know, basically ex overextending the limits for the planet. And I'm going to argue that the most critical turnaround is inequality, uh, is that we have to do something about reducing inequality. So let me explain what exactly I mean. So in Earth for All, we are talking about the need to upgrade our economic system. We are basically saying that a large part of our problem is really our economic system. It's not um, you know, just things that happen because they happen. It's the way we have organized our economies and the way we have allowed particular forces to dominate, which has become the problem. And we also argue that this is a critical period. We are really uh, I won't even say we're at a turning point because at the moment it doesn't look like we're turning. At the moment it looks like we are rushing headlong towards disaster. And so really what we do in this decade is absolutely critical uh, in terms of our own future as human beings, in terms of the planet. And we really have to start now. And that's important because we are seeing, and we will come back to this, we, we are seeing that governments are not acting now. And part of the reason they're not acting now is that there isn't enough 
public pressure on them to act now. So we have argued that upgrading the economic system to become viable in the way that I just mentioned requires five very major turnarounds. We have to eliminate poverty. Now, this is something that was not explicitly talked about, for example, in the limits to growth perception. So we have certainly brought in distribution much more significantly, but of course, reducing inequality, which is different from reducing poverty, it's not the same. Uh, and it's a separate but equally important issue. And of course, the extent to which you reduce inequality will also impact your ability to eliminate poverty. We've argued that you have to empower women. Once again, that's an aspect, gender inequality is a part of overall inequality, but specifically both because women have a greater, uh, uh, the impact, the distributional impact on women tends to be different and more adverse. And also because given the way gender constructs of society persist in our, everywhere, women have a greater role to play in some of the other transformations. This includes the fourth turnaround, which is to transform food systems. Our current global food system is completely broken and it really has to be made something which is sustainable, which is relying much less on major transport and cold chains and et cetera, more on local, on natural, on less chemicals, and on types of food consumption that are less um, oppressive for the planet. And of course, we have to transform energy sources and use. And this is really the one that everyone talks about. It is that we have to reduce carbon emissions. And the way we reduce carbon emissions is by changing the nature of how we use energy, how much we use energy, and what kinds of energy we use. Okay. But here, as you see, this is one of the many. These are all interrelated. None of them can really happen on its own. And I'm going to argue that reducing inequality is absolutely critical for all of the others. And particularly in this talk, I'm going to show you how it's also critical for transforming energy sources and their use. So we know that inequality is actually a big culprit for our current ecological disaster, for want of a better term. And I'm going to use carbon emissions, not only because they're so significant in themselves, but they're actually a useful proxy for other kinds of environmental damage and overexploitation of nature. So here you're getting the extent of carbon emissions per capita, CO2 emissions per capita in 2021 in different countries of the world. And the, the countries where in fact it's darker are in the very high range of per capita use, but they are also the countries which are uh, shall we say, excessively extractive and oppressive of nature. So it's not just about carbon emissions. It, this, tends to be, it, this tends to be a useful proxy for all other environmental crimes, if you like. Now, here we can see that it's rich countries, but it's also rich individuals uh, who are the largest carbon emitter, emitters per capita. And in fact, I will show you data later on, which shows that the richest 10% often Sometimes the richest in the world, it's several hundred times more the carbon emissions than the poorest half of the population. And that's really significant. And as I've mentioned, that's also part of a disproportionate grabbing of other natural resources. It's not only about carbon emissions is in that sense, a useful indicator of the extent to which other atrocities on nature are committed by particular categories. Now, how does this work? It, it's a strange thing that, you know, we know that, let's say, planetary concerns, carbon emissions, all of these things are global in nature, and they cannot but be global. You can't, uh, you know, you don't expect a typhoon to respect a passport and visa border and so on and so forth. So definitely climate change is global. Yet we persist in treating it nationally. We persist in uh, getting uh, an international compact for trying to make different nations commit to certain types of change. So how does it work? Well, the carbon emissions for each country are calculated by the UNFCCC, which is the organizer of the COPs, the Conference of Parties. We just had the 27th COP in 
Sharm al Sheikh in Egypt. And so we calculate total emissions by country. And as you can see, then these become the basis for climate negotiations. And so countries go to the different COPs in Glasgow and Egypt, and they say, we will promise to reduce our emissions by whichever amount by so-and-so date. Usually it's a date quite far in the future when the politicians who are making the claims are not going to be around. Uh, but these are the claims which are made. And um, it typically assigns a responsibility to countries depending on their total emissions and their emissions relative to GDP. Now, one problem, because that's, the GDP is supposed to give you the extent to which you can afford to make the changes that are required. Now, one problem is that it doesn't use the actual exchange rates when you're measuring the GDP across countries, it, which is a bit weird when you think about all the investments and imports and the technologies that are required uh, for making changes, all of those will have to be paid for in existing ex market exchange rates. But we measure GDP in what is called purchasing power parity, uh, a measure of GDP, which is a construct. It doesn't exist in the real world. It's, um, it's a construct that's even more of a construct than cryptocurrency, if you like, uh, which uh, uh, is, you know, assigns a certain uh, value of the currency, depending on what it is assumed that currency can buy in particular countries. Now, there are many problems with the PPP measures. I won't go into the details here, but we can talk about it later if you like. One major problem for our purposes right now is that they overstate the incomes of poorer countries. So poorer countries appear to be richer than they are and therefore more able to afford to make the changes. The other thing about the way the UNFCCC does this is that they measure the carbon emissions according to how much is emitted within the national boundary. So they are production based, okay? Uh, and this underplays the continued significance of consumption in the North. Consumption, which is not based on production, but on imports. And I, I will tell you a little bit more about that soon. But Given that, we do see that there are really quite significant increases in carbon emissions for certain countries, mainly China and India. And in both the recent COPs, China and India are the countries that have been singled out for special attention, concern, and even criticism, because there's a really dramatic increase in emissions, as you can see, uh, from in 2000 compared to 2019. China has become the world's largest emitter in absolute terms. India has become the third largest emitter. And the United States, which was far and away the largest emitter, is now a kind of middle second, well below China. And so it's really being argued that, look, China and India have to stop emitting so much because they are the ones now driving climate change. Uh, there's a lot of problems with how this is talked about, but let me just mention one very obvious problem, which is the historical carbon debt. The reason that we have climate change at all today is because there has been a period of history in which CO2 emissions have been put out there in the atmosphere. And that cumulative, uh, those cumulative emissions are what have caused the climate change. Now, as you can see from this, if you look at a very long period, this is an estimate based from the mid 19th century to 2011 then the developed countries today with less than 15% of the global population today, according to this, are responsible for about 80% of the total cumulative carbon emissions over this very long period. Now, this is only the produced carbon emissions within their own boundaries. It doesn't count what has happened because of the exploitation of nature, of deforestation, of mineral uh, extraction, and all the other ravages that colonial colonialism did in the rest of the world. And it doesn't look at post-colonial practices in other parts of the world. So it's only the carbon emissions produced in these countries. So that's significant that less than 15% of the population bears the burden for creating 80% of the emissions. Now you could turn around and say, well, listen, 1850, nobody knew there was a thing called CO2 emissions at that time. Nobody saw it as a problem. Why are you blaming you know, so many generations back uh, for something that 
is a really re relatively recent part of human knowledge. Well, it turns out that more than half of these historical emissions occurred just in the last 30 years. And we know that in the last 30 years, people knew. Governments knew, scientists knew, everybody knew about the problem of carbon emissions. And so much more could have been done in terms of climate mitigation, but instead it clearly accelerated. The last 30 years have accounted for more carbon emissions than the previous century, practically century and two decades, the previous 120 years. So there is a problem there. But there is also current carbon inequality across countries. Now, supposing we didn't just look at total emissions, we looked at per capita emissions. And supposing we didn't just look at the final demand, at, at the production, that is how much emissions you produce in terms of the things you produce, but we also looked at the total final demand, that is how much you consume and invest. That's really what we should be looking at because as I mentioned, rich countries have effectively exported some of their emissions through foreign trade by importing goods that require more carbon intensive production. This is especially the case since 2002 and China is the biggest player in this. It's really China, which has dramatically increased its carbon emissions in production because it is supplying exports to the rich countries that are importing these carbon intensive goods, okay? So certain types of automobiles, machine tools, a range of manufacturers, a lot of the things that are called dirty industries in the North are, have been relocated to the global South, particularly to China. And so China has, if you like, a, a positive trade balance with these rich countries and a negative carbon balance. That is to say, it is producing more carbon because it is exporting these goods. Some other countries also to a lesser extent, especially the resource exporting countries, the mineral exporting countries. But if you look at final demand-based per capita emissions, you get a very different picture from the chart that I just showed you, where China and India are so important. Here in the US is by far the biggest uh, culprit, okay? Uh, it, the US emissions are more than around three times, more than three times that of China and um, more than nine times that of India per capita. But also it's the other rich countries that are the big emitters, Japan, Germany, the UK, um, Italy, France, these are big emitters. And Russia as a mineral exporter is a big emitter, but the picture changes completely if you look at final demand. Yet final demand emissions are not those which are used in negotiations or in projections or even in the promises made by different governments. But, and now this is a, a very important table to my mind. The problem is not just international. The problem is that in fact, there's huge emissions inequality within countries and within regions. Now, the table here is based on data from the World Inequality Lab in Paris, and it's very painstaking, important work done by a team led by Lukas Nossel. Uh, they have come up with these estimates. Now, it, let's recognize that these are estimates based on a lot of heroic assumptions because you're using consumption surveys and you're using national income data, and then you're combining that with the evidence you have on the emissions of certain types of consumption and allocating carbon responsibility within countries on that basis. But it's a really interesting and I would argue surprising result because we find that the difference between the bottom 50% and the top 10% is huge across all regions, every single region, okay? It's uh, more than 14 times in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, but it's also more than seven times in North America. And it's nearly 10 times in South and Southeast Asia. So there's a very large differences within countries and regions. But the richest uh, group, the top 10%, are big emitters in practically every region except Sub-Saharan Africa. And what's more significant is that the top 10%, let's say in East Asia, is significantly worse in terms of per capita emissions than North America or Europe. 
Now that's a kind of surprising result, right? It tells us that just looking at countries or regions in a very aggregative sense is not necessarily that useful. So in fact, East Asia, the richest 10% of East Asia are consuming more than, uh, are producing more than four times the per capita incomes of North America and um, more than uh, eight times or nearly eight times the emissions of Europe. What's even more striking is, as I will tell you in a minute, that the bottom 50%, the data of the World Inequality Lab suggests that the emissions of the bottom half of the global population have been declining over the last 15 years. And they have declined in every region. It's not just in the poor countries or in some richer countries. Every region has seen a decline in the per capita emissions of the bottom half of the population while the top 10% emissions have grown. So as I said, it's really, it's, it's the rich who are responsible. In fact, the richest 10% of the world added more than half of carbon emissions in the last 25 years, or rather in the period between 1990 and 2015. And the richest 1%, it's even worse, added 15% of emissions, more than all of the citizens of Europe and more than double the poorest half of humanity, which added only 7%. I mean, annual emissions grew by 60%. The richest 5% were responsible for more than one third of this, but the emissions of the poorest half fell. Now, if you could bring the emissions of the richest 10% of the world down to just the EU average, which is eight metric tons per capita, global average is about 4.2 metric tons. The EU average is about eight metric tons. If you could just bring the richest 10% of the world down to the EU average, you would make global emissions fall by one third. So really it's dealing with the rich. The second aspect of inequality that I want to highlight is that of climate finance. Now it's kind of evident that the changes we require in terms of reducing energy use per unit of GDP, while making sure that the poor have access to basic needs and services and that the condition of those who do not have these basic needs and services is improved, that we actually eliminate poverty, we will need large investments. The estimates are anywhere between $2 trillion to $10 trillion per year that are required. In 2012, uh, 10 years ago, at one of the COPs, the governments of the rich countries promised to provide $100 billion every year. And it was understood that this would really be public aid from rich countries to the poor countries. At that time, it was mostly for mitigation rather than adaptation or loss and damage. But it was essentially that we will we'll give you $100 billion every year. Turns out that they've, on average, they've given less than two thirds of that, around 60, less than 67 billion per year. And most of it is anyway, not even bilateral. It's, uh, but also very little of it is public finance. Bilateral public finance is less, around 30 or less than 30 billion per year. Multilateral, which is really the, the multilateral development banks like the World Bank and the regional banks and various climate funds. All of these, have also accounted for relatively little in the region on an average of less than 30 billion per year. Now contrast this to the massive amounts of money that rich countries found they could produce during the pandemic, where you, you saw trillions of dollars, not billions, trillions of dollars of stimulus being provided in many countries and fiscal stimuluses, stimuli that were enormous. Uh, because you suddenly decided that you needed it. And therefore, you know, all the fiscal constraints that were earlier seen as impossible to address, suddenly those constraints were not a problem anymore. You could generate trillions to spend for recovery from the pandemic or dealing with the pandemic and so on, but you can't provide even that promised 100 billion when the need, as I said, is in trillions. But more than that, it's not just that you're not providing money for making those investments, you're continuing to subsidize the dirty fuels. Fossil fuel subsidies continue to be really huge. There's a very important study done by the IMF 
research department, which actually looks not just at the direct subsidies, which are the gray columns on the left side, if you can see, those are the explicit subsidies, the ones that are mentioned in the government budget saying, this is a subsidy going to this fuel company. Uh, that comes to about 550 billion per year, but the indirect subsidies, which includes a whole range of things, you know, it includes different kinds of tax breaks, uh, different kinds of uh, financial incentive, different types of guarantees of loans to enable access to reliable credit at cheaper interest rates, uh, various other subsidies. All of these, if you add up, then you get a much larger number. You get 5.8 trillion in 2020. Now, that's nearly 6 trillion, okay? This is before the Ukraine war. Before the Ukraine war, you had that kind of dramatic uh, expenditure on subsidies for global fossil fuels. The United States alone is spending excess of 700 billion on these subsidies, explicit and implicit taken together. Now, if that's the kind of subsidy you're giving fossil fuels, then let's admit it. You know, uh, the green energy doesn't have a chance. The markets will inevitably favor the fossil fuels. And that's exactly what they're doing. Private finance is largely going to fossil fuel sector. And this is before the Ukraine war. And of course, things have got much worse after the Ukraine war, no doubt about it. But all this was happening before the Ukraine war that we were hugely subsidizing fossil fuels. So when, you know, you, you say we are not pricing carbon right, we have to put in a tax uh, to make sure we tax a, a price carbon right. But in fact, we are already pricing it wrong because we are subsidizing investment and production of fossil fuels. So it's worse than not getting prices right. We are actually making prices e uh, even wronger than they would otherwise have been. But I would like to argue that, you know, the, uh, uh, that the point that many developing countries often make when they're talking about climate inequality is that, you know, we, uh, we can't do it because we have to reduce poverty. We have to make sure we electrify everybody's household, uh, all the households in rural areas. We have to make sure that schools and hospitals and so on have access to electricity. We have to make sure that everybody has a minimum level of consumption which needs to, meets their basic needs and services. And for that, you definitely need more emissions. That's what is usually argued. I think this is a false dilemma. I think it's wrong. We know that there are different ways of achieving this greening. You can choose a development pattern that, for example, improves the energy efficiency of the economy. That is, you use less energy per unit of GDP and that you can do when you shift to sectors that require less energy, for example, uh, or when within that sector, you have technological change that reduces the amount of energy that is required, or when you have differential pricing and certain kinds of consumption where you go in for, let's say certain service activities that do not use the same degree of energy. Um, agriculture and industry are known and construction are known to be very heavy, heavily energy intensive activities, but a whole range of services is not. Once again, crypto is an outlier. It's, it's hugely electricity consuming, but a whole range of other activities in services are not so energy intensive. And of course, within energy sources, you can reduce, you can clean it up. You can clean up your act. You can, uh, that's our fifth turnaround. You can reduce the share of the most carbon emitting sources like coal and petroleum based and natural gas to clean renewables. I haven't mentioned nuclear here because let me admit to being conflicted about the use of nuclear. I really am not sure whether one should uh, prioritize nuclear investments, but certainly clean renewables like solar and wind and some hydro sources, particularly small uh, hydro sources are all clean, reliable, local, and therefore not subject to geopolitics and strategic concerns. And it's possible to shift to these. We have the technology to do it. We also have the technology that makes some of these renewable energies cheaper to run, although not cheaper to invest because these are all having to be new investments. This also clearly requires a change in urbanization patterns so that there's less need for individual transport, 
more reliance on safe, green, clean, public transport, less polluting as well. Uh, locational changes that will reduce commutes required for different types of activities. All of this requires much more investment, no doubt about it, but it can be done. In, in our book, we have argued for 2.5% of global GDP. Chomsky and Pollen actually suggest you can do it with even less, with 1.5% of the GDP of large economies only. But of course, in addition to finance, you have to have access to the new technologies. It's not going to work if you cannot access the technologies that are critical. And there are uh, you know, many which are now at the cutting edge of a lot of these new green developments. It's not just green hydrogen, but even the very act of electrification, the creation of new batteries, the reliance on particular rare earths and minerals, all of these are related to the, the very rapidly changing technology but that technology tends to be extremely concentrated. And there is a lot of protection of the intellectual property involved with these. Now, in fact, developing countries have a lot of problems with the current mitigation strategies. And I would argue that they are not designed really to help. Many of them either you know, do nothing to change the, the issue or they sometimes make things worse. So cap and trade, for example, it doesn't reduce aggregate emissions, it just transfers the location. And what's the big deal about that? How is that an advantage? Uh, private financial markets, as I mentioned, they're still incentivized to fund the brown investments, uh, the dirty investments, uh, partly because of subsidies, partly because of the market responses to shocks like the Ukraine war. But also there is no regulation, there's no disincentive to go in for the dirty investments or fossil fuel investments. In fact, as I said, it, they're, they're still subsidized and incentivized. But um, we could easily think of regulation. We could, for example, tell the major private equity firms or firms like BlackRock and so on, that if you're going to, for every dollar of fossil fuel investment you do, you are required to do $5 of investment in renewable energy. It's not an impossible thing to require. But we are not doing that. We're just letting markets operate in a world in which governments have already fixed everything in favor of the fossil fuel sector. Of course, there's this other supposedly big innovation, ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Indicators for Private Investors. I think it's now fairly clear, and there have been lots of exposures and whistleblowers and others who have pointed out it's just greenwashing. And it's worse than greenwashing because when you declare the ESG and then you can get into a joint venture with some government or public sector entity, you will also get a lot of other advantages like credit guarantees and perhaps underwriting of some of the risks and various other cost incentives without actually necessarily doing very much. There's a lot of greenwashing going on in the name of ESG. The current favorite approach is for carbon taxes, but carbon taxes tend to fall more on the poor. And we know that there is really very little compensation. It's either lacking or it's in inadequate. So the poor suffer when, in fact, as I told you, they are really not the big emitters, even in the rich countries, and their emissions have been declining. Okay. Border carbon taxes, the current favorite of the European Union and the Biden administration, these are really just a, a device for trade protectionism. Because to be effective, a border carbon tax has to have a global system of collection, compensation, and sharing of revenues. But we know that that's not going to happen. We, a tax and dividend policy requires trust, but it requires significant international cooperation. Unfortunately, neither of them currently exists. And in fact, we can't even get a global agreement, a tax convention uh, that would force multinationals to pay their fair share even in their home countries. So there's a real problem in terms of bringing in border carbon taxes or national carbon taxes without addressing the source of the problem, which is the subsidies and the lack of regulation of private finance and private operations. There's also a problem that the mitigation strategies themselves can add to global inequality, okay? Um, I mean, we know that 
all of the new technologies, especially in renewables, they require different kinds of new minerals. They require lithium, for example, they require a bunch of rare earth, they require palladium and rhodium. There's, there's a whole range, manganese, uh, different kinds of minerals that are required in greater quantity. And if we really do want to electrify the world, we're going to need lots more of these. Now, the picture you can see here is of a field, a salar, salar de uyuni in Latin America, in the, um, uh, in the, uh, there's a triangle of Bolivia, Colombia, and um, is it Ecuador? Anyway, the, in Latin America. And it's, it's quite a remarkable visual sight because these, uh, these shallow ponds are colored by the salts in them. Um, but these are the, some among the major sources of lithium. And lithium is a critical element. It's required in batteries and solar panels and in many, many ways. And it's become one of the highly prized minerals, which has become the locus of a lot of resource grabbing. And but also its environmental implications. The mining is done in what would really be considered quite crude ways. Uh, if uh, it were being done in the global north, if, if, if it were, ha were happening, let's say in the US, it's, it is happening in the US in indigenous territories, but not in areas where people with a voice can actually complain about it. It's displacing, it's uh, environmentally and ecologically damaging, and it is already creating all kinds of other inequalities in, in the process of the extraction, because everyone is so concerned about ensuring there is enough lithium to meet the demand for the renewables, that they're less concerned about how that is got, how you actually access that. Another example is, is the recycling of waste. Uh, I teach currently in um, New England, and you know everybody is very progressive and environmentally conscious and happily putting things into recycled and you know, other rubbish and, and, and feeling very uh, proud that they are busy recycling. But in fact, all the stuff mostly gets exported. Until very recently, even all the plastics were just simply exported to the developing world, supposedly to be recycled, often just resulting in landfills, huge dumps of plastic waste, electronic waste, et cetera. The plastic waste, the global trade has come down uh, essentially after China banned it. And now there is a talk of a global plastics treaty, which would regulate it and force countries to do something about their own plastic generation. But a whole bunch of other waste is simply exported to developing countries to be recycled with very hazardous conditions. There's a lot of safety issues, a lot of other issues, use of child labor, use of extremely poor, discriminated and degraded workers. And of course, very bad environmental implications. But this is not something which really is on the radar of even the progressives in the global north who are talking about the recycling. So what do we want to do then? Well, we have, as I said, mentioned many elements of this turnaround. I'm going to tell you only about the aspects of the international architecture that I think are critical for enabling this reduction of inequality. Uh, we have to, first of all, in our negotiations, we have to use market exchange rates, not these imaginary purchasing power parity exchange rates to determine the GDP and therefore the obligations of countries. We have to bring in and recognize historical debt, carbon debt, and consider the shares of future carbon debt on a per capita basis. The Paris commitments currently, uh, even the zero, the net zero commitments of the rich countries still imply that by 2050, they would still account for 60% of the global carbon budget. I told you they were responsible for 80% historically. They're not coming down anytime soon. They're still anticipating, given all their own pledges, that they will account for more than half of the global carbon emissions. And they're still less than 15% of the world population. Probably even, they will be even less by 2050, because in some of these countries, population is coming down. We have to increase public finance massively, and we don't have to see it as foreign aid. That's a big problem. It's being seen as charity from rich countries to these poor recipients who are all you know, not, not able to do anything for themselves. We have to recognize that climate finance is necessary to save the planet. 
So it's a global public good to save the planet. So we need global public investment. Now, what does that mean to say that it should be based on global public investment principles? It means every country contributes based on their capacity. And then there is a joint decision about where you put the money. And it's not based on, you know, I feel like I, I, I a so-and-so country wants to give its money to Rwanda because it feels it's an ex-colony or whatever. It shouldn't be that way. It should be in terms of the need of the greatest uh, relevance and importance from the point of view of addressing climate change, mitigating climate change, dealing with loss and damage, all of these. There's a lot of talk now of blended finance about how we have to get the private sector involved because we can't do it with just the government. And that's absolutely true. Public investment has to increase massively, but it won't be enough. We will have to get private sector in. But the way in which it's sought to be brought in, the talk is all about incentives and de-risking. There's nothing about creating regulations and conditions that would be meeting social goals. So we are offering all kinds of carrots to the private investors without any stakes or without even ensuring that they meet what they promise to do when they get these incentives. And that's a major problem because it means that the public money that is then provided for all of this incentives and de-risking is effectively wasted. So how do we get all this money? Well, one possible route is expanding the special drawing rights of the IMF. Uh, we currently, well, recently in 2021, we had a $650 billion uh, increase in SDRs. That's the amount that can be done without the US government having to go to the US Congress, where it will inevitably not be accepted. So it is possible to just have an annual increase in SDRs uh, of, let's say, up to $650 billion. It's not the best option because it's given according to IMF quotas, which are very archaic, which, uh, you know, again, the rich countries get 60% of the IMF SDRs, and they don't use them. They don't need them because they have currencies that are global. Uh, but we could, we could try and recycle, or we could think of specific ways of allocating, but we can anyway just expand because even with, you know, this unfair distribution, it's still some money especially for countries that are facing severe debt problems and other things. It's one way of addressing uh, some of the budgetary constraints. There's a, su a suggestion that has been made by Raghuram Rajan, which is quite interesting, uh, uh, that you have a global carbon fund. So you basically, you, you make every country contribute to the extent to which it its average per capita emissions are above the global average. I told you the global average is around 4.2. So if you are, say, the European Union at eight, then you have to pay in to that fund. If you are some other country, which is, let's say, at um, three, then you will get money from the fund. In other words, it will be distributed according to where you are in terms of the global average. Now, that puts an incentive on the large emitters to bring it down. And it actually gives an incentive to the low emitters to stay low because they will keep getting financial incentive for staying low. And of course, then this money can be used for greening the economy in various ways. And of course, as I've already mentioned, you really have to regulate and control the private finance that continues to fund brown projects. And of course, Eliminating the subsidies for the carbon emitting fossil fuel industries is one of them, but we do need others as well. The most obvious strategy, given everything that I've said, tax the rich, right? I just showed you how the rich are the ones responsible, the rich are the ones creating the problem. Many ways you can do this, but you can tax their assets, you can tax their wealth, you can tax their incomes. And that would have some sort of uh, impact on reducing their consumption, the very carbon intensive consumption. But you can also ban specific activities and products. For example, you can ban SUVs, you can ban private jets, you can ban flights beyond or at least heavily tax flights beyond a certain number in a year. Maybe a trip to the moon, I would say just ban it. It, it shouldn't be a joyride. Uh, but you can do many different things in terms of 
curbing the emissions of the wealthy. And as I told you, that's really one of the bigger parts of the problem. We have to make the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks green banks. That means they have to have more resources, more ambition, more willingness to go in for long-term finance that is devoted to addressing the climate challenge. At the moment, it's, it's a kind of side activity. It's not what they really do. And they still are funding a lot of fossil fuel, coal and everything else. We have to really, the international financial institutions were made, you know, nearly a century ago, just after the Second World War. They're really not fit for purpose today. They are, the structure is wrong, the governance is wrong, the framework for the operations is wrong. And it, in some ways, they are really an impediment to achieving uh, the kinds of things I've been talking about. The other big aspect, which is a relatively new constraint, is the intellectual property rights regime of TRIPS, uh, which is now administered by the World Trade Organization. This has become a major constraint because it's enabling the monopoly over critical knowledge and technologies, which are essential for a green transition. And uh, private companies, often with public subsidies that have enabled them to get this, nonetheless have the proprietary rights over this knowledge and they tend to hold on to them. They don't distribute, they do not dis uh, disseminate, they do not provide licenses to other producers. They hold on to them and charge very high prices, which re really means that most of the global South cannot afford these technologies. Just as we saw with vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19, uh, we are seeing a similar thing going on with the green technologies and it's even less affordable for the world as a whole. It's even more terrible because it means that the control of climate change, which has to happen, I told you it's an urgent problem, will not happen very easily. And of course, we have to recognize all the time that the transition itself must be just, not just for the workers, some of whom will be displaced by you know, the ones who lose their jobs in coal or in other industries, in the fossil fuel industries, but also for those who are impacted by the new resource grab, the indigenous peoples, who are displaced, those who are affected by very polluting and aggressive forms of mineral extraction and, and so on. So we just had a COP in, in Egypt and did it do anything? Did it offer us any hope? Well, yes, in principle, they recognized the need for loss and damage. And so they've announced the creation of a new fund. But nothing else is known. It's all the whole idea that there's a committee that will give us the details and how much. Given what we've seen with climate finance, I don't anticipate that it's going to be a lot of money. But we can always hope. I mean, at least the principle has been accepted. It's the thin end of the wedge. We can aim for push for more. Um, they did talk about phasing out, but only for coal. They didn't mention other fossil fuels. After Ukraine, apparently natural gas is okay, and even some other stuff is okay. So suddenly, you know, uh, it's only coal that is a problem. They did mention that they would like to remove inefficient subsidies on fossil fuels, but here the adjective is the killer. Why not just say remove subsidies on fossil fuels? Which are the inefficient ones compared to the efficient ones? How are you defining them? So the chances are that every country will decide that they're subsidies on fossil fuels are efficient, and so they will not be phased out. And there is a small amount that has been pledged for adaptation finance. Small means, I mean, pathetically small, right? 230 million. I assure you, this is not even small change for the average campaign lobbyist in Washington. It's very small in terms of the total adaptation needs. Now, mitigation finance, you know, the 100 billion that was promised? They, they, last year, they said, oh, you know, we're going to try and meet it. This year, they haven't even said that. They are saying nothing on the failure to meet the previous commitment. Instead, they're just saying, we are going to plan to set a new collectified, quantified goal in, on climate finance in 2024, two years from now. So basically, very little. Why is there very little? Because governments are not seeing the urgency and therefore they're not reacting or they're doing very short-term knee-jerk responses based on immediate political considerations. If there's a midterm election in the US or the rise of the right wing in Europe or something, 
Instead of trying to change the discourse and explain why it is so essential, governments are responding to those political forces by basically, you know, subsidizing even more the fossil fuel industry, doing whatever they can to reduce oil prices and, and so on. It, governments will only change when people force them to. And so, in fact, it's, it's on all of us, uh, not all of us just in this group, but all of us collectively. It's on us people to go out there, disseminate, spread the word, persuade others and force change. But the point is that we don't have much time. Uh, the window of opportunity is a very short one and it is, we can see it closing. So we really have to have urgency on this matter. I, I think I've talked for too long, so let me stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ayati. Uh, thank you very much also the audience. And thank you very much to everybody from the chats that's and everybody making sure there's an interesting discussion happening at the moment in the chat. So uh, there is a number of questions that I will be happy to, to, to bring over. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. We have about 25 minutes. The question is quite a long list of questions. I have about five questions myself. So maybe I'll send them later on even. <laughs> So I start with a question from uh, Giovanni Marocchi. The, the question is, on top of everything you said, what do you think is the most urgent transition that relates to all the others? Um, where should we start from? And then basically make some example like food, culture, energy, economy. Uh, yeah, you said all things. Where, when do you start from? Um, I, I basically want to emphasize, yeah, I think we have to start from reducing inequality. I, I really do think, I think the rich and powerful corporations are the problem. Rich people uh, with completely unviable consumption patterns and the ability to influence government policies and regulation. And large corporations, again, who uh, are not sufficiently taxed and have the ability to influence government policy. These are the problems. We have to start by reducing that power and, and posing countervailing power. And um, how do you do that? It's not so simple. I, I think Gaia had a question I just saw there that, um, you know, how do you reduce inequality? There's a pushback, right? The rich are not going to say, well, sure, take our money. You know, Elon Musk, I don't see him coming up and saying, all right, you know, go ahead, tax me. I, so it really does require a major shift in political thinking. But I don't think it's impossible. And if I had to think of one, if you like, uh, example of how it, things can be different, it's Colombia. Now, if you remember, Colombia has been ruled by a very by right-wing regime for decades, right? And it's an extremely unequal country with um, a lot of a history of violence and so on. What is remarkable about the uh, the new Colombian government is, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, global corporations are talking about how they're happy that it's not as extreme as they feared and it's not as left wing as they feared and so on. But what's really remarkable is that they have already introduced tax policies that would significantly tax rich individuals, rich households, and large corporations much more than now, partly by eliminating loopholes by reducing the ability of corporations to shift the money outside, by imposing a minimum tax on their total earnings, and by taxing the wealth of individuals or of Colombian citizens wherever they are held. Now, if somebody had asked me even last year, would this happen in Colombia? I would have said impossible, there's no way. It's such a, uh, you know, the, there would be so much opposition and pushback and they control the media, they control, the rich control so much that they are not going to let this happen. But this is a tax policy that has been approved by parliament and is becoming law. Jose Antonio Ocampo, who is the finance minister, has been able to achieve this uh, in, a, in a very, uh, I would say to me, <laughs> a surprising way. It actually gives me hope that you can, if you, you can generate change, if you can create enough of a public outcry against some of the things that are happening. So for me, yeah, inequality in its many manifestations is the biggest challenge. One of the ways to address it is fiscal inequality. Another way is the regulatory 
uh, structure, which is currently making our, what is called the pre-distribution, very concentrated, very unequal. We can bring in regulations that reduce this ability for the rich to just keep getting richer and richer, and for rentier incomes to be the fastest growing incomes in any economy. It's, it, these are happening because we have enabled it through our institutions and policies, but we can change those. Okay, thank you very much, Yakti. Uh, so I'll try to go quickly. So this one is from Philip Rainstead's. And he asked, what are the drivers of reduction in per capita emissions among the bottom 50%? So a lot of it has to do, uh, as I said, with the change. And I remember this is data up to 2019, okay? So before the pandemic, a lot of it has to do with the change in the structure of the economy, that people are moving to activities or forms of consumption that are less uh, carbon emitting. And that's part of structural change in an economy when you shift away from industrial goods to and, and uh, agricultural goods to certain services. But it's also because of income distribution itself. I mean, it, it is the case that the um, distribution has actually meant that uh, the um, that the richest 50% have lower shares of the economy in pretty much all regions. And so, you know, they, you're, you're seeing, in fact, a reduction, which is partly reflecting that adverse income distribution. The top 10% in, in all regions, it's also because they're getting new forms of extremely carbon emitting consumption. I, I, I mean, the private jet phenomenon is, is one. I forget, but there were thousands of private jets heading to COP27 to Sharm El Sheikh to talk about climate change. Uh, it seems a bit ridiculous, but that is really what is happening. And uh, the, you know, a whole range of other programs. There's also incentives for investing in extremely fossil fuel intensive types of activities, which the rich indulge in more than others because they also invest more. So all of that taken together. Thank you, Jayati. Uh, I have a question emerging from, let's say, I tried to make a question out of the comments of Peter. Uh, so you basically said quite clearly <laughs> the right thing is to tax the wealthy and try to redistribute and uh, use the money of the wealthy to generate this sort of equality and support the sustainability of the world and so on. The, the, the issue is this approach might be that aggregating people might generate, you know, so pointing the finger to those maybe acting good among all of those that do not act well. Uh, so for example, if you are a wealthy person, at the same time, you make a lot of investment in, in the in sustainable development, uh, your carbon footprint is very little, you already don't use flies, you know, assuming you are a wealthy person riding the bicycle to go to work every day. Uh, what would you say? Would you still tax this person? Or maybe there is a different way, such as taxing, for example, things like consumption or other things? So I would argue that wealth taxes are required in any case, but not wealth taxes on everybody. Or really, I would argue that there's a case for taxing the extremely wealthy, you know, super rich, not just all rich. Uh, let's also remember that, you know, we already tax wealth, we tax property, right? House properties are already subject to property tax. And everybody seems to accept that. And yet, most of the people who pay property tax have very small houses. So it's in that sense, it's, a, it's you know, it's regressive. I'm saying, no, let's not do all that. Let's tax the extremely wealthy. People whose incomes are above, you know, let's say 100 million. Tax those, tax their assets. And now it's possible to know their assets financial and real and others, tax their uh, incomes, but tax only the very, very top tier because it's also necessary from a redistributive perspective, but also it provides you the fiscal resources you need to deal with all of these challenges. That's one. Yes, and tax certain kinds of consumption. I think I've already mentioned that. To me, a private jet, every trip should be taxed at maybe, I don't know, a thousand percent. Uh, 
uh, because it is something which is deeply damaging for uh, the environment and wasteful. So let's tax that. Let's tax certain kinds of production, even of food, let us say beef. We know that beef is environmentally awful. I'm not saying ban it or stop it, but tax it. Yes, it will become something that is very rare and luxurious, but it's okay. There are lots of other things to eat. So I'm saying that we need to think of ways in which we attack both the inequality and the consumption of the very, uh, the inequality in terms of the assets and incomes of the very rich, the extremely rich, but also certain types of consumption which result from having those excessive incomes. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes and five questions. So I think we can manage. Uh, the first one comes from the Sean, and he's, he's basically saying, claims they will advocate. Isn't it the case that if we reduce inequality and we keep consumption as it is today, we end up creating more problems from climate change? No, we obviously have to address. But what I'm saying is that reducing inequality will itself contribute to the reduction of emissions and therefore climate change. So in fact, I'm seeing it as, as a causation. And it's not uh, that it's the only causation. In fact, I think there was a very good comment in the chat that these are all uh, interrelated. You can't think of one without the other. You can't think about uh, you know, a food trans systems transformation or an elect uh, energy transformation without looking at all of the others. You certainly can, cannot think of poverty and inequality as being completely separate. So these are all definitely interlinked. But um, the issue of the climate transition, I think one, uh, and, and uh, this was highlighted earlier by Roberto, that one problem with the uh, first Limits to Growth book was that they didn't adequately, I think, recognize the significantly adverse role of inequality in driving certain patterns of consumption and then changing the nature of government policy and regulation to create incentives for everybody to be consuming in a certain way. So the, the fact that this has become so extreme in the US, that US uh, at per capita incomes, which are not that much higher than some other countries, still has such a high per capita carbon footprint is because of the way in which that inequality is then expressed in particular regulatory practices and other policies. Okay, thank you very much. So I go to the question of Wei Gang Yan. He's saying the North has been reluctant to invest in green technology for a long time. And one of the results of it is the energy crisis that we are living now. Uh, how can the North, particularly USA, view energy transition as an opportunity rather than a barrier for economic development? You know, I would put it the other way. How come the North is not viewing the, <laughs> the current energy crisis as an opportunity? It is staring you in the face. In fact, when the Ukraine war first happened, President Biden actually said this. He said we should see the oil price rise as an opportunity to shift to greener forms of energy. Within a week, the whole tune had changed and it was all about doing whatever you can, whether it's hugging MBS in, from Saudi Arabia or pressurizing countries to expand their gas product, oil production to keep prices down because of this need to respond to domestic political currents. And I think that's really, in a sense, uh, because of the failure to communicate the real problems. It's because enough people in the US for sure do not either see the urgency of the problem or realize how much of it is linked to fossil fuel use and how there are alternatives available if only they would demand of their governments that this could be done in a relatively short time with sufficient investment. It's possible. They, I think the European Union's uh, package uh, was definitely better than the US and definitely more aware of these things. It's still not ideal or adequate, but it, it was definitely more aware of the need for the transition and the need to change the incentives. In the US, even the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the one that contains all these subsidies and green investment ideas and, and so on, also provides subsidies for fossil fuels. 
because Senator Joe Manchin, who has, as a Democrat, has a critical voice, you know, he's, he's the sort of, was the necessary vote required, was able to demand and receive subsidies for coal and other fossil fuels. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dayati. Uh, I have the next question from Philippe Greenstein. So he's saying that the ideology of growing the pie, grow the pie, yeah. is like yeah. saying economic growth, is normally against, distracts from the divide the pie ideology. So you either choose to grow or you either choose to divide and share. So, and, uh, and then he says, if you say that inequality is the key problem to address, then would you agree that we need to dismiss the myth that green economic growth is possible within planetary boundaries? You know, I have always been a little confused by the green growth versus degrowth argument, to be honest. To me, GDP is a very poor indicator of human progress. Okay, I think we all know that there are major problems with GDP. It doesn't count a lot of things that really matter. Uh, things that are of value for society, like a lot of unpaid care and, and things like that. It uh, does not, but it includes as positives, things which are actively destructive. Weapons of mass destruction add to GDP, the, the production of those adds to GDP. Uh, things which are deeply polluting and congesting add to GDP. Terrible high accident rates with lots of hospitalization add to GDP. So. GDP is not a good indicator of human progress. Supposing instead we said of thinking, you know, what will we can we do to increase GDP? Supposing we put the question the other way around, what can we do to get an economy that achieves health for all, education for all, the building of everyone's capabilities, lives with dignity? What does an economy that provides these mean? Supposing we ask that question. Now, if you ask that question, then maybe you need an economy that also has GDP growth, maybe you don't. So in our book, we notice that uh, the average uh, sort of, you know, per capita income at which you can hope to achieve the basic MDGs, the basic needs for all your population is around $15,000 per capita. So that clearly means that countries below that level will have to keep growing to generate enough to make sure that they can provide for all their citizens. But of course, it has to be distributed properly, which it isn't at the moment. In India, for example, 90% of the gains go to 10% of the population, not to everyone else. So growth on its own is not enough. But after that point, whether you need to grow or not, it's a moot point. Maybe you need other things that improve the quality of life. I mean, look, a, a clean, green, efficient, non-polluting system of public transport that is affordable creates less GDP than a dirty, chaotic, polluting, privatized system of transport. In, in, and most of Asia, we have the second one. We have terrible, mostly privatized, filthy, polluting, overcrowded, and almost unaffordable systems of privatized transport. Whereas if we had gone in for public investment that would generate the cleaner, greener type, we would get less GDP, but a better quality of life for everyone. So I think we should stop thinking of GDP and whether that has to rise and fall. To me, we have to think of which is the economy we need to give us our social goals and our environmental goals goals and which is the economy in which we can achieve those social goals in harmony with nature and the planet. That may be with more GDP, it may be with less GDP, I don't know and I frankly I don't care. So for me the green versus degrowth uh, debate to me it's a red herring. I don't think we should get into that because finally people on both sides of the debate and they're all very good friends of mine the policy changes they're asking for are almost identical. So let's focus on those policy changes. Let's think of what we need to, to make better quality of life for everyone and think of those policies. And whether it leads to higher GDP or lower GDP, to me, that's the wrong question. And I think that obsession with GDP as the sole indicator or certainly the primary indicator of human progress is, is a very unfortunate thing. Thank you, Jayati. So we have the three last questions, and we have about 
six minutes and then we should also close. So the first one comes from uh, Gaia and uh, probably you touch it a little bit. So she, she's basically speaking about the sociological barrier uh, as trying to put the hands on the money of the wealthy people. <laughs> it basically doesn't come easy, right? <laughs> So what are your thoughts in breaking the barriers for the for making the the wealthy basically to to give away their wealth for you know the sustainable world? Well, you know, I mean, I I take guys point completely. The wealthy are not going to be saying, "Oh yeah, sure, take our money." Uh, we have to create sufficient public demand for uh, more equitable outcomes that it's impossible to refuse. Essentially, that's it. And I'm not saying that means that you have to have a bloody revolution and, and kill everybody and so on, no. These are really, when you think about it, these are things that were seen as the norm even 40 years, 50 years ago. In the 70s, the marginal rate of taxation on the top 10% in most rich countries was above 50%. It was 70% in some countries, 80% on the top brackets. It's unthinkable today. In fact, we almost have flat rates so that, you know, uh, George Soros famously said that he pays less tax than his secretary because there are not only is it a flat rate, but there are so many means that the rich have to actually avoid paying taxes in a perfectly legal way. It shouldn't be so crazy to say, let's get rid of those loopholes. Let's rationalize the system so that the rich cannot avoid taxes, not different from evading. They're not being illegal. They are hiring the fancy tax lawyers and show them how to avoid it. Just like large corporations have massive tax planning offices, which are basically hundreds of young tax lawyers figuring out the best way to minimize the tax burden. We, we know that there are ways in which you can reduce that loss to the exchequer. These are very, these are not revolutionary things. These are relatively simple things. Why are they not done? Because there's no demand for them from the public. There's instead, there is active lobbying from the rich. So even democratically elected governments really only get the pressure from the rich. They don't get the pressure from the public saying, let's force this change. I think in a way, if I hope, and I, I'm sure Gaia also, if this book does anything, I just hope it raises the number of voices demanding these changes because that's the only way you will get the change. You're not going to get it with, if you just say, well, you know, governments will see the light because they don't. They don't suddenly become good and, you know, saintly. They, they do things because they're forced to do things. So in a way, you just have to generate popular mobilization to force some of these changes. Okay, thank you very much. So I will, we have just the last two minutes. Uh, and uh, I just want to ask the last two questions very quickly and then merge together the Gaia, Schiavina, and the Gerardo Costa question. So Gerardo asks, we think, if you think more in depth, maybe emissions could be attributed to supply chains, where instead Gaia says, there is alternative to electrification for developments. Uh, and, uh, and the other one is if we should uh, account for emissions rather than you know in on people consumption maybe into the supply chain yes absolutely and i think one of the things which i didn't mention which is very important is material use you know the the material use has exploded in the last 30 years and definitely we need to think of patterns of consumption which reduce that material use. And there are so many different ways in which this happens. And in more advanced economies, it's also about packaging and uh, things like that. But it's also about just patterns of consumption in which excess is desirable. But when I talk about electrification, there are two levels. One is just simply access to electricity, which I now believe is a human right. Okay, 40% of rural households in India don't have it. They don't have electricity in their homes. To me, that's not acceptable. You have to have electrification at that level. So that's one level of it. But the other is that many of the things which, on which we rely on fossil fuels can be provided through electricity powered by renewables. And so that's the second sense in which I think electrification is being used here. 
And so one is just to allow people to get to a minimum access to goods and services. The second is to ensure that that access is occurring in ways which are using renewable energies and technologies and are ideally using less energy per unit of consumption. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We got to 6 p.m. Uh, I don't know if you can just answer my last, very last question, and then we close. I think if just because it's the last one, I can take the chance to go a bit over time. My question is: you, you said multilateral development banks should make a make a move to solve inequality. So things like the World Bank. So I think COP27 was a big push on the World Bank to reform things like that. So in your view, to solve inequality, how would you reform the World Bank? Well, I mean, there are different levels at which the World Bank needs reform. One is certainly in terms of its structure and the voting power and the fact that, you know, the, the head of the bank is not competitively uh, elected, but is chosen by the United States, depending on which government is in power and so on. Uh, but more importantly, the bank doesn't really function as a development bank in the same way. It's focused on specific projects which are very micro with rather than a larger vision of dealing with major development challenges. So we need to make it a development bank which is focused on looking at that green transition and how to achieve it. Which means being willing to put money out there in many different projects in different ways. And uh, which means being much more flexible about the kinds of money and the kinds of requirements on the borrowers. And it also means changing the capital requirements, the capital adequacy ratios. There's a real scope for dramatically reducing those requirements so as to enable much more financing. And of course, you need much more funding of the bank itself. It's, it's far too small in relation to our needs. And certainly, when you think about the original plan for the IBRD, it was a much more ambitious plan. It has really come down to being a relatively minor player in what is one of the greatest challenges humanity has faced. So as an institution, it's not now up to that challenge. So we need to make sure it is reorganized in a way that it would actually be able to respond to those challenges. Uh, thank you very much, Jayati. So at this point, I really think we are gonna close. So thank you very much. So please, for those who are still here. <laughs> well, thank you for those really excellent and thought-provoking questions. So. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, this is also the last of seminar of the series. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much for being with us. We don't have to advertise any further seminar apart from uh, the co-presence, Sandrine Dixon, the CLEF, that uh, told us she will be with us in February. So I will email separately all those that are already in the link that will be an in-person event. So Sandrine will be in Cambridge. We are still understanding how to handle that. But please, if you want to come, you are very much welcome to join us. And uh, Jayati, thank you very much also for thank the great jet lag you had today from US to to India, so it's super late for you. So thank you very much for being with us until this time. So seriously, uh, very much appreciated. And uh, I hope you also enjoy the call and the seminar. And uh, we will be in touch. Uh, yes. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank and have you. a great day. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very Bye, much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and for all the good discussion. Thank you. <laughs>